get going. So this new book, new programming, new everything, it gets right to the point and it has a lot of supplementals. It's not just reading in the textbook. It's all the resources we're going to provide you, but it gets right to what you need to know. I'm saying this before we start because always pay attention to the nurse's role is what you are always tested on and why you are doing what you're doing to a patient. So it's, you can't memorize, I got to give oxygen, I got to, you know, for every single patient, it's going to be a different type of intervention. Okay. So in your book, always pay attention to, um, what you're assessing, why you're assessing it, the interventions. Is this intervention appropriate for this specific patient? Um, if I place oxygen on this patient, is that the appropriate intervention? Things like that. Um, I put this in here. It's out, straight out of your book because I like it because A, it has all those wonderful numbers we should know by heart. Really quick, gives that quick gas exchange um, of how it works. We are going to be talking about mechanical ventilators. That is that fine line of balance of excreting that toxic CO2, making sure we have enough um, oxygen um, to make sure we have tissue perfusion and we have enough in our arterial blood. Okay, so oxygen therapy, very second semester information, but I just wanted you to have this so you can review and recap. Remember 21%. Um, hypoxemia, remember, is a decrease in arterial oxygen. Hypoxia is a decrease in um, oxygen in our tissues. I always put the table so you refer to because that right there tells you um, where to really kind of focus. Those tables in the book are amazing, so always just go there. So types of hypoxemia. Um, each one is a little different. So circulatory, sodic, anemic, it's just the different cause. So like for anemic, it's the blood loss. We don't have enough um, blood going through our system to move the oxygen through for our, um, for our tissue. Okay. Hypoxic, again, we're not able to intake and absorb the oxygen coming in. This could be a respiratory issue. All right. Oxygen toxicity may occur when two high concentrations of oxygen greater than 50% is administered. So this can be that fine line of us administering oxygen. Oxygen is not necessarily the solution to everything. Um, this could also be the concentration. If we're not paying attention and give too high of a concentration, remember too much of anything is bad, we can actually cause some serious tissue damage to a patient and lung damage. Um, again, as we get into mechanical ventilation, we control the patient's breathing, the patient's tissue perfusion. So please keep that in mind. All right. We have to make sure we're not giving too little because that can cause, um, tissue death, um, that can cause brain damage. And if we give too much, it can cause damage. All right. Symptoms include substernal discomfort, parathesis, dyspnea, restlessness, fatigue, malice, progressive respiratory difficulty, refractory hypoxemia. So it's just not going in the right place. Um, atelectasis, okay, and infiltrates. So basically what this means is your patient is just not acting right. Your patient is, something's just not quite right. Maybe they were resting comfortably for you. Now you see that they're just not able to get comfortable. Maybe they're moaning, they're groaning. Um, maybe you're not able to wake them up. Maybe you're having to do a sternal rub. You know, these are changes in behaviors and it's a trial and error. You have to kind of go down the list and see what actually would be the cause. Um, so prevention. I don't know if you guys have noticed in your experiences in the hospital, what's the first thing everybody does? Puts the nasal cannula on. <laughs> okay. Every time a patient walks in without maybe even getting vital signs, let's get the oxygen on. Everybody has oxygen on. If they walked in and they've been on oxygen for two days, why not put that oxygen on? We need to get out of that habit. Okay. We need to assess, is this intervention correct for them? We take it as this just simplistic little invention, that intervention that doesn't even need to be paid attention to sometimes. You know, it's just second nature. Get the cannula on. Get the cannula on. Do they really need it? What is their oxygen levels telling us? Okay, this is huge, especially with COPD, because they can't excrete that CO2. So let's take it off. Let's check how much they are. Let's wean them down. Is this intervention even necessary anymore for this patient? Okay. All right. So here we go. PEEP and CPAP prevent and reverse atelectasis and lower oxygen percentage to be used. So PEEP 
and CPAP are more of an invasive um, type of um, administration of oxygen. They are actually to support keeping the alveoli open, keeping those lungs slightly expanded to make sure that they can get oxygen in where it actually needs to go. Why would a patient need such help? This is right here where you would pause and start thinking about it, open up your book. What would cause them to need this? I'm gonna give you a few examples here, but this is where you're like, I don't know, I don't know. This is the whole perk of having recordings. You pause, you have your book open, you take notes and open up, open up and see what would be some causes. What do we do? What are some interventions, okay? So we're gonna get into respiratory failure. Respiratory failure can be caused by many different things. It can be caused by just a bad cold that did not go well. We didn't move around. We have some atelectasis now, right? They're collapsed. More atelectasis we have, we cannot transport that oxygen. We can't get that oxygen through our lungs. Um, pneumonia, <clears throat> COPD as stated earlier, pulmonary edema, things like that, okay? So there is some other kind of cause. And CPAP, okay? This could be a chronic, a chronic lung condition, okay? Obesity sometimes can cause that lack of movement, that lack of um, oxygen transportation, all right? So right here, as it says, prevents and reverse atelectasis to allow, but it sounds amazing. It sounds like the cure, and it is. It's very helpful, especially when I have patients that are over-sedated um, and I can't quite get them up enough and they just can't quite get that those muscles going to expand their chest and get that chest rising for that good, good deep breath that CPAP comes in handy but remember too much of anything if we give too much peep or too much CPAP what did I say it does it keeps the um, alveolite open if we do it too strongly we can actually uh, pop them and cause permanent damage okay then we really can't get any oxygen anywhere so again every kind of treatment what this goes back to is every kind of treatment takes time and you have to start least invasive and work your way up all right um, you already know about oxygen administration here. What I wanted to kind of put here, reason for you, is just the different types. So refresh yourself at this table of how much oxygen goes through a nasal cannula, how much oxygen would go through an oral, oral pharyngeal, can't talk this morning, catheter, um, and a mask, okay, transcutaneal catheter. As the patient is needing more oxygen, we have to change the type of equipment we are using. So refresh yourself in that, please. All right, so this is going to be very brief. This is very review. Um, incentive, incentive therapy, incentive spirometers are given right after surgery, when we walk in the hospital, for any kind of procedure. It helps what? Practice to what? Expand and open those lungs to prevent any kind of issues that we would need a CPAP or a BiPAP or anything like that, okay? Um, if we are laying down more, we're not taking those deep breaths we need. If our activity level has decreased because we are not feeling well, our activity level has decreased. So this, if by doing it when we are awake at least that 10 times, you know, we're giving those lungs the workout it needs. We're preventing any kind of complications. So I want you to understand this is the preventative intervention. This is the least invasive intervention. When reviewing and going over your test questions, when you're taking an exam, don't just jump right into, I need to intubate and I need to intubate now. I need to get them on PEEP. No, maybe we just need to intervene and give the least invasive therapy first. So I want you to make sure to think about it, read the question, what intervention do we start with with this specific patient and what their needs are? All right, so make sure they're sitting up, make sure you set a realistic goal for them. What does that mean? So the main rule everybody's probably heard throughout their healthcare career is 10 times an hour. So let's critically think, let's think realistically. Are we really gonna wake our patient up? Oh, it's 2 a.m., get breathing. How about when they're awake? How about when they're sitting up? How about sit it right next to them, okay? Make it be the last thing they do before they go to bed, but every hour that they are awake, okay? It needs to be the habit of the first, one of the first things they do, okay? All right, mini nebulizer therapy. It's a handheld apparatus that disperses moisture and agent. This, again, this is very least invasive. It helps support opening up the airway and opening up the lungs for breathing for minor issues. Um, what it does, you know, nebulizer treatments, what's funny, when we have patients come into the hospital, can I get a breathing treatment? You know, we have any kind of respiratory issues. What patients don't understand, I think sometimes we don't understand, is 
the point of it is not for, oh, instant relief and feel so much better. It actually promotes the coughing, promotes movement of whatever's in there. If we are having any kind of um, mucus, junk, to clear our airways, to expand our lungs, it actually promotes all of that from coming up. So it actually makes <laughs> them worse for a minute, but in a good way. So sometimes that kind of education needs to be discussed. All right, chest physiotherapy, we toss this on here because this is one of the most common therapies, especially when somebody's going through some kind of bronchitis, pneumonia, um, surgery, you're starting to feel those lungs kind of sounding moist before we get pneumonia, before we start having all this atelectasis. Maybe we do need that extra therapy, okay? It's this vest across the chest they put, and it kind of just, exactly what this is, vibrates, loosens up um, all that congestion in there. Um, respiratory comes in and does this. It does need a doctor's order. Um, people with um, cystic fibrosis, this is a very common type of treatment. So any kind of, you know, gunk, somebody recovering from pneumonia that needs, it helps get that movement going to release those secretions so the patient can cough it up and get it out. All right, so for that posterior drainage, that vibration kind of starts loosening it up. It removes the secretions, improves ventilation. Because remember, if your lungs are filled with mucus and gunk, we can't expel any of that. Um, we can't get any O2 in or expel any of that CO2. All right, um, allows the force of gravity to assist removal. Again, um, use and prevent to relieve bronchial obstruction. Let me make sure I got all these um, and I gave you the table to refer to. So I don't know if you, this is right from your book. I couldn't get it any bigger. I'm sorry. I just wanted you to see optimal um, positioning for optimal perfusion and getting out any kind of gunk in the lung. So an anterior lung, anterior, excuse me, sorry, lower lobes and baser sig. So see where they're kind of um, right here. The pillow is kind of giving that shift and that shimmy right there. It kind of gets the lungs to kind of open up and clear. Sitting them upright, propping them, okay? Kind of that perch position here. So depending on what we are trying, the intervention we are trying to do is the different positioning here. So it's kind of nice if you hear they have lower lung pneumonia, especially in the right lung. Okay, we can kind of refer here and go, all right, let's lie them lateral, basal, so on their side, kind of tilted right there at the hip, okay? If it's upper, right, kind of that upper chest congestion, let's get them sit up, let's push them over, not push them over, but tilt them over <laughs> and um, get that certain positioning. So kind of refer here, um, know what would be a good positioning to how to care for your patient, okay? Again, it is an expectation if you were taking care of your patient that day to know how to care for them. This is least invasive. Wouldn't you rather be positioned this way, get some physiotherapy, get a breathing treatment, than have somebody come in and put a tube down your throat because you can't breathe anymore. These little minor least invasive things have an outcome that is better for your patient. So think about that, consider that, and remember these positions. All right, percussion and vibration, again, we kind of went over kind of that patting on the back and vibration, okay? I kind of gave you that little picture from your book. See, it looks like a Velcro vest there. Um, that's the happiest patient I've ever seen that's having respiratory issues. And it'll just, again, give that percussion and that vibrate to loosen up what needs to be. All right, home oxygen. You know some patients are on it lifelong. Some patients are on it temporarily. Um, that's all I'm going to say here. This is very um, remediation, so we're going to go on. All right, emergency management of upper airway obstruction. So, an acute upper airway obstruction caused by food particles, vomitus, blood clots, or any obstruction of the larynx and trachea. Why I brought this up is uh, one of the biggest causes here actually can prevent this from the breath from the patient to stop breathing. Also, it can prevent what? Pneumonia, an aspiration pneumonia, or ammonia from not able to you know breathe at all. So first and foremost, right, we have to make sure the patient's breathing. We have to find the cause of why they're breathing, what this obstruction is. So let's go down the ABCs, right? We don't know yet that um, what's going on, what's the issue. So what would we find first? Start telling yourself, upper airway, what would some be the first signs and symptoms? Um, not breathing, maybe some what, changes in color here, okay? 
Um, also, what we would see changes in vital signs, oxygen dropping. That probably wouldn't be your first sign and symptom, though, so please remember that. Yes, when they roll through an ER, we're going to get them on the monitors. We're going to get the chest on. We're going to get the pulse ox. We're going to get an ABG. We're going to get these things going. But assessing your patient and looking at your patient is the biggest, biggest key factor here. Okay? You're going to have um, ER lecture um, very soon as well, and we're going to get into that triage type of thing. So you need to kind of make sure. So those rapid observations. So in, just looking at your patient. Do they look right? Are they pale? Do they have a sense of panic? Okay, and remember, no sound is bad. At least if you're hearing some kind of strider, <gasps> some kind of um, possible wheezing, something is moving. When you hear nothing and that strider is starting to diminish, that's bad. Okay, so palpitation. Can you hear any air going through? Um, excuse me, auscultation. Can you hear any movement going through? Palpitation. Can you feel anything? Okay. All right. Worst case scenario here. Our patient stops breathing. They're not able to get that trans oxygen transport. This is an optimal. We need to get a tube down. This is worst case scenario. This is not, this is invasive. So just oxygen wasn't working. Putting them on a mask isn't working. Our breathing treatment we talked about isn't working. Okay. Tissue perfusion is starting to become life-threatening. This is bad. We can't wait. If our airway is closing from whatever, you know, obstruction is happening, that we can't get that oxygen to move, that CO2 to move out. Possibly, I think um, the last slide had an example of blood clot. We need to keep our airway. We need to preserve our airway. We need to get a tube in now. Um, it's usually a provider or an anesthesiologist that does this. It is our job. What is our job in anything is to stay with our patient, assess our patient, assess the need, advocate for our patient. Is this the correct treatment for our patient? So I wish I'm going to try to find a video before a lecture. Um, as we intubate, not we, we are here there to support the patient, hold the patient. The patient more than likely will be sedated. Um, a balloon to keep the tube in place is um, placed right here with the tube to hold in place. So just remember that any movement or tugging in this area can cause permanent damage. Okay. And now I want you to also consider, I want you to pause here if you want, um, get a straw and I want you to push your lips around that straw. Okay. I may make you do it in lecture. We'll see. We'll see what kind of mood I'm in. And I want you to walk around just five minutes walking around, just breathing through a straw, do some jumping jacks, get a little swift about it and see how hard it is. This is what the patient's going to feel like breathing through a tiny, tiny, tiny straw. It is one of the most scariest feelings in the world. Um, right away, our fight or flight kicks in our panic, and we are going to want to fight that tube, tooth and nail and try to pull it out. So sedation, it goes hand in hand with an ET tube for the safety of the patient. Okay. So we need to make sure the airway is always patent in the same place. That balloon is in place. Our patient is comfortable and sedated. Even if they're sedated, we need to do a pain assessment to make sure that they are comfortable. Um, assess for mechanical ventilation. So this tube needs to be set to something to breathe for them. You know, for a while in my world, I work in the PACU. We just place an Ambu bag on it and we breathe for them for a little while. Sometimes they just need a little time to wake up. But more than likely, we are going to need some type of um, machine to be doing this for us, and we program it. Okay, so once your tube is in, you have to stay with the patient. Any patient who is intubated is considered a one-to-one -one nursing care. Okay, again, they're breathing out of a straw. So for that reason alone, we have to check patency again. No, we did not put it in, but we have to advocate and monitor for our patient. Can you hear um, air going through? Can you see their chest rising? Can you hear the air movement? Okay. They need to be placed on a mechanical vent. Um, and the excretions will build up immensely. So there's going to be a lot of suctioning. So we need to know our role with the patient who is now vented. Here's a picture really quick of an ET tube. As it comes down, this is the balloon here. This is what keeps it in place. So again, for safety, the patient needs to be pretty sedated so they don't pull it. It can cause a lot of damage. 
When it is removed, we need to make sure that could be in our nursing scope. I take them out every day in the PACU. Um, that the cuff is deflated down. Okay. Um, all it takes is just a 10 cc syringe to remove the air, and 10 cc syringe full of air to fill it. All right. So there is a variety of different mechanical vents. Okay. It depending on the patient's need and why they have it. So positive or negative pressure. So that positive pressure means what? PEEP is one of those. It keeps that areola expanded. Negative pressure. What does that mean? Okay, so remember, we are controlling everything. The depth to every breath. So how many respirations a minute a patient's going to have, okay? How big an inspiration the patient needs. How big of an expiration the, expiration the patient needs. All right? Um, if CO2 is the problem, we need now more pressure to excrete the CO2. If oxygenation and perfusion, we need more pressure to move that oxygen through, okay? So, for that reason alone, the doctor will give an order with a certain amount of vent settings. We do not control the vent settings. It is a collaborative effort. The doctor says what they want to mat, respiratory and you, but more respiratory, to be very honest with you, will come set up the vent for you, get it ready with the ordered amount. But your job is to figure, does this setting make sense for my patient? Is this what the patient needs? How would you do that? By vital signs, by oxygen, by perfusion. Perfusion is key here. Can you feel pulses? Is there, is there um, limbs clammy, lungs? How do the lungs sound? Okay, so this is what a few things that you need to start thinking about when your patient is vented. All right. Um, prevention of ventilator assisted pneumonia. Now, it's wonderful. We can have a patient on a ventilator, give them a little bit of a break and breathe for them. The sedation keeps them rested. So how would we make sure that our patient is comfortable? They can still be sedated, but if they're moaning, groaning, still not quite staying still, um, grimacing, just kind of restless in bed, they possibly will need more. Um, some of the common medications used to sedate is fentanyl. Um, we also use propofol, um, sometimes Dilaudid. And it's not uncommon to give supplemental opiates on top of that. So just take that into consideration as well, okay? So, okay, think about it. Your patient now is ventilated on a vent, laying down, probably numerous different lines and drips. Are they moving? No, they're not. Okay, so for that reason alone, that's going to cause some atelectasis. That tube down here can carry a lot of bacteria. So one of the biggest interventions, I want you to pay attention to these tables I put here, would be lots of oral care, um, lots of suctioning from excess secretions. It is almost a guarantee if a patient is vented too long, they're going to acquire ventilated assisted pneumonia. This is not good. This, we need to prevent this for as long as we can. This is one of the biggest reasons that we need to remove the ventilator off a patient as fast as we can, okay? By assessing them, making sure that maybe they are breathing against the vent. Sometimes our patient only needs it for a few days, and how would we know that? Their respiratory rate is increasing regardless of the settings, okay? Sometimes we need to decrease the vent to see if the patient can do well on their own. This is a very big prevention. All right, so here's your norms for your CO2, your O2, okay? I put them here for um, quick reference. So some manifestations, again, no breathing, very shallow breathing, respiratory distress, confusion from a lack of oxygen, increased work of breathing. Again, that assessment, that initial laying eyes on your patient is key. Are they struggling to breathe? Are they not? Are they starting to get panic? Again, if you are short of breath, you can't get enough oxygen in you already have a sense of panic, that fight or flight kicks in, okay? You can start to get a little bit delirious and not make any sense, okay? Um, confusion with need for airway protection, all right? Circulatory shock. We are going to have a nice long lecture on shock, um, but understand shock affects the whole body system. So that means the whole body system is affected. Um, we are going into a form of organ shutdown, so this is not good, all right? Controlled hyperventilation, patient with severe head injury, and they're not able to control their uh, breathing response anymore, okay? All right, so here's some of the types I kind of went over in the last slides while I was rambling. Um, positive pressure that can be given with via face mask that covers the nose and the mouth. This is the least invasive. 
So this is just those big masks with the big sealant right here, okay? It gives a certain positive pressure, okay? The CPAPs, maybe you know from sleep apnea, it's probably more common, that if you work in a hospital now, you know the patients that have sleep apnea sleep with that type of um, mask on with the seal, okay? Um, this is a least invasive one. So indications, respiratory arrest, like sleep apnea, pauses in breathing, um, serious arrhythmias, okay, and head or face trauma. Not everybody needs this support all the time. So here's your ventilator modes. We'll go over this a little more in lecture day. I gave you the ones that we're paying attention to. Know the difference between them. So continuous means what? We are continuously giving oxygen, expiratory. It's a constant. Assist, maybe the patient is able to take good inhalation, but is having problems excreting the CO2 and exhalation. So this means we are going to set that vent to have more of an exhalation. Maybe the patient is breathing independently on their own, but not as deep and not as much as they need for optimal perfusion. So maybe we've been able to see the patient can independently take five respirations in a minute. But we need that patient for optimal perfusion to be breathing at minimum of 10 respirations. So we can um, control the ventilator to come in and do the work for the patient when they weren't able to do it for them. Okay? So that's um, kind of what we're, we're focusing on here. All right, so here's the different ones. So controlled, again, just how it sounds. The ventilator is controlling everything for that perfect rhythm, okay? So continuous here for the CPAP. So just the different waves that you're going to see on the machine. Here is pressure support with CIMB. Look, where the stars are is where the mechanical vent kicks in with the settings. This is the patient, okay? And this is where the machine kicks in, all right? And here, and here. Okay, synchronized again. Good breath. Not bad, not bad. Boom. Okay, so kind of look at it here. All right, the patient receiving a mechanical ventilation. So assessment, if they, first thing first, if you know your patient has an airway, we need to go in. What are we doing? We're checking patency. Is it where it needs to be? Do I see those, do I see that chest rising? Do I hear air moving? First and foremost, is it on the patient? Is it on the floor? Where is it? Okay, um, systemic assessment of all body systems. There's more to breathing, okay? Perfusion, cold, cold clammy limbs. Okay, is their lips purple? Is there change in color? Are they diaphoretic? Everything, neurological status. Can they blink their eyes if they're intubated? Can they obey some commands? Can they squeeze depending on the sedation and depending on how alert we have them currently? Comfort level and abilities. Again, we use a nonverbal pain scale when somebody is um, intubated. And it goes with grimacing. It goes with, again, moving, shifting in bed, okay? Emotions. If we are taking them slowly out of sedation, you're going to see a patient who is still trying to fight to take it out. Scared, shocked, maybe you won't remember. A lot of the medications we give when a patient is intubated will cause some amnesia, especially the propofol. They may have a loss of time. That's very scary. And again, consider the feeling of breathing through a straw. There's a lot of anxiety, um, fear. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what's wrong with them. They don't know if they're dying. That's one of the biggest fears, all right? Assessment of equipment. So everything we are using, is there any holes? Is there any kinks in our tubing? It, it, this, this is now part of your assessment of the patient because this, this machine is breathing for your patient. You know, are the alarms set? Is the machine plugged in? If you hear the alarm going off on your machine, we're not going to right away call a code. We're not going to right away, you know, yell. Let's do a process of elimination. Did the patient pull the tube out? Is it all the way down where it needs to be? Is their chest rising? Maybe I'm stepping on the cord. Maybe the plug fell out of the wall. Okay, maybe the plug isn't working. You know, did my machine get turned off? Little things like that, okay? So it, it's just a trial and error. All right. So we want to do um, planning, goals. As we are doing this, remember that proper maintenance. Airway is one of the most important things. Are we keeping it clean? Are we doing our oral care? You have specific orders to keep their CO2 levels at a certain amount, your O2. So have I been able to do that? It's just a constant, constant checking to make sure that those levels for the patient remain optimal for perfusion and what the doctor ordered. 
So you are constantly in there checking, constantly in there making sure your tubing's good, um, making sure that you change your tubing when necessary, okay? Any type of absence of um, infection. We want to prevent that ventilator system going as much as we can. So uh, maybe some chest physiotherapy, some uh, supplemental breathing treatments, making sure, remember the positioning, we reposition them and change positions very frequently as much as we can if the patient can tolerate it, okay? As much movement, if the patient is able to move at all, let's get them to move. Even a little bit of range of motion is um, helpful. You know, this is something you could bring the family in on, you know, just getting those arms moving up and down, the legs moving up and down. You'll see instances where the patient is doing better, and with assistance, we can get them sitting up at the side of the bed, even though they, ha they are still kind of ventilated and we're trying to wean them off. So depending on their need, what they can do, let's get them moving, okay? Successful coping measures, let them cry. Let them be angry. Let them just be there for support. Um, just hold their hand, tell them they're not alone. If family is something that we can have in the room, let's have them in the room. Um, anything we can think of to make them feel, you know, you're gonna be okay, you're not alone. It, it is the most scary thing so just take that into consideration. All right, this is how you study, okay? I know the care plans and the diagnosis are like gibberish sometimes and, and how it was taught first semester because it's so much. I want you to take these. I want you to ineffective, ineffective gas exchange, ineffective airway clearance. Okay, these are their problem. These are your patient's big priority problems. So let's start, what would be your priority intervention with impaired gas exchange? What is your priority intervention with these, okay? What are some things we could do? What are some things we're gonna be monitoring to make sure that they stay okay? Vital signs, labs, you know, maybe another chest x-ray to check out their lungs and their status, um, support, okay, movement, like we said. So go through each, this is how you study. This is the nurse's role. All right, collaborative problems, ventilator problems. I kind of brushed on some of those a little bit. Um, plugging it in, making sure it's not kinked, there's no holes in our tubing, they didn't yank out their tube and it's thrown across the room, um, it didn't get moved, It's the tape is not, you know, the way it's taped is not coming off, the settings need to be looked at, checked, um, alterations in cardiac function, everything affects the heart, everything affects the lungs, is, it, is, the, are, is this patient tolerating this intervention? And their vital signs when they are intubated because they can't speak to us are the biggest way they speak to us, you know? Is that blood pressure rising? Maybe we need to start a drip. Maybe we need to start medications. Maybe they're in pain. Okay, if we're not able to get that down, we need to figure out some other interventions for this patient. Okay, barrel trauma. Remember, too much of a good thing is bad. So pee, too much pressure can cause those atelectasis to pop. And if we do some permanent damage in these lungs, we can never fix that. We can never go back. How are they going to have that oxygen perfusion? So we cannot give too much or push too much. We start least invasive with our settings. We just give a little, a little. Patient's still not getting enough oxygen. A little more, a little more. We don't start the settings at max. We start at the most minimal least invasive, okay? Um, pulmonary infections and sepsis. Again, the biggest thing is this is the nastiest area. We have a tube down our throat. They're not able to swallow their secretions. They're making more mucus, right? That's that inflammation response, okay? We need to make sure we're suctioning regularly when we hear all of that because that will cause an infection. That infection will eventually go in our bloodstream and cause sepsis. A sepsis is an infection in the blood that goes throughout the body. That is not a good day. That is very life-threatening to the patient. Um, when, you, when you get yourself finally into a critical care unit, um, or even a med surge unit, you're going to see sepsis runs rampant. It's very life-threatening. It's very hard to recover from, and we will go through it in um, shock. Okay, delirium. We kind of brushed on delirium a little bit. Remember, there's many reasons that cause delirium. Um, the extensive stay, the lack of a wherewithal. We have been sedating this patient as stated. They're going to have some amnesia. The long-term use of an ET tube, the oxygen, will cause a big amount. It's called um, ICU delirium. It's unfortunately normal for them to wake up confused, combative, scared, 
fearful. So just a lot of reorienting, a lot of making sure that the patient is safe. You'll see in an ICU setting that um, restraints can be used a little bit more common than other units because there's one-to-one -one care and to make sure they don't hurt themselves or pull their tubing out. If we can't, it's for support of sedation as well. But understand they can be confused for quite some time. Just a lot of reorienting patients and keeping the patient safe would be one of the biggest, biggest things here. All right. Um, some of your interventions here, kind of we've been talking about that constant communication, coping, allowing the patient to feel it, communicating with family, keeping the family in the loop is one of the biggest things. You are caring for the family as well. They are fearful. They are scared as well. You know, uh, reassuring them. Some family is very fearful of touching a patient when they are on all this machinery. Telling them it's okay. Talk to the patient. You know, a lot of the time you're going to see vital signs drop. A patient actually relax, you know, they get so tense and rigid, you'll actually see them relax when they feel, hear their wife's voice, their kid's voice. Just the touch, the touch, holding hands is huge. You know, that's that helps healing in itself right there. Okay, that movement, range of motion, monitoring that airway, suctioning, getting any kind of clearance out. Um, let's see, did I miss any? Strict eyes and nose is key with somebody who is intubated in an ICU setting. Okay, strict eyes and nose. Um, that means you are probably monitoring eyes and nose every hour to two hour, what's going in and out of this patient. Um, edema. There is a lot of imbalance because this patient is not able to necessarily... We are giving a lot. It's hard for the patient to metabolize and it's hard for the patient to excrete. Um, that auto-regulation of knowing they have to avoid, go to the bathroom, that fight or flight. Remember the fight or flight I keep talking about? When we are in some kind of emergent situation, our body wants to hold on to everything. We're in a panic. So we will start to swell. We will start to see edema. If we're not breathing well, we'll start to see edema in the lungs. Remember that IV fluid we are giving, we need to metabolize. If we're not metabolizing it through, we're going to hold it in. This can start affecting the lungs and cause fluid in the lungs, fluid in the limbs. It's very normal to give lay six. And very regularly in this. So again, monitoring those lung sounds. Maybe they were clear. Maybe they were kind of diminished. But now we're starting to feel some, hear some crackles and they're kind of moist. Maybe they feel it sound like they're gurgling. Okay. <clears throat> Minister medications to control primary disease. There's always a reason. There's always a cause. So when you walk in to take care of this patient, what, what brought them here? What caused them to get intubated? What caused them to have this impaired gas exchange? Okay. They could have a few comorbidities on top of all this that can even make it worse for them to heal. So priority care needs to be to make sure we keep that diabetes under control while they're here. They have a history of heart failure to make sure we're giving that heart failure medicine. We're removing that excess edema. All right. So again, this is not one of your average um, assessments. You know, you listen to lungs change a shift. We're listening to them. You are reassessing your patient head to toe every hour to two hours in this ICU setting. So that is listening to your lungs and remember charting it. If you didn't chart it, you never did it. They are on monitors that you are monitoring constantly those vital signs. Okay. Perfusion is every hour to two hours. Movement, um, capillary refill, all everything, bowel sounds. Okay. Measures of clear airway, suctioning, I've said, um, mobility. Let's see, humidification of airway. You don't want them to get too dry. It's a very nice comfort measure. And again, you do not want to be late on those medications. All right. Um, some of the biggest interventions for your tube is tube care, making sure you keep it clean. Um, we've talked about this, the suctioning, oral care, oral care, oral care. It has to be around the clock. We do oral care with chlorhexidine even to make sure it stays as clean as possible. Elevate that head of bed. Remember, your patient has an airway. Are you going to have them flat? No, 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 no. It's usually about semi fowlers, about 30. Um, just not flat, okay? Um, cuff management, making sure your cuff is in the right place. You're too, everything I have been saying, okay? Let's see. Range of motion, communication, stress reducing techniques, verbal communication, talking, promoting quiet, calm in the room, uh, not a lot of noise. You know, if we don't need our alarms and our, our IV going off all day, remember, it's just you and that patient all day, one-to-one. -one. Let's let's decrease the amount of beeping in this room. Let's be on top of changing our fluids, our drips. Um, include family. Again, as you're explaining to the patient, even though the patient is sedated and asleep, you are still talking to them. 
you're still talking to family. You're good morning, so Mr. So and so. How are you doing? I'm in here to check your IV fluids. I'm gonna do a quick quick poke. I'm gonna check your labs right now. Um, this may hurt a little bit. I'm gonna change your gown. I'm gonna give you back. Might be a little cold. Sorry. Doesn't matter if they respond to you or not. They can hear. This is one of the the um, senses that does not go right away. They can hear everything you are doing. So you are not going to be the type of nurse who is talking about the vacation you had with your new boyfriend over the patient's bed. You are going to make sure you are talking to the patient. Share a story with the patient, even though they're asleep. Share a story with the family. Be welcoming. Be that nurse. All right. Monitor for possible complications. We've been over most of these complications. Um, let's see. Troubleshooting problems. Again, you're not going to call a code right away. You're not going to call 911. You're going to look around, trial and error, check your tubing, check your machine. Is it on? Okay, table 21 has all the different little tricks I went over. I went over most of them, but they have them all there. Okay. So weaning. I spoke a little bit about you want to get the patient off the ventilator as fast as you can. Okay, it, it's amazing we have this technology but you know any too long anything is bad it can cause some permanent damage to the patient and the longer you have somebody um, vented the harder it is going to be to get them off okay so the process of withdrawals three stages just monitoring them how are they doing are they breathing over the ventilator kind of like I stated earlier so is it gradually remove it so decrease the settings see how they do without the support see how they do without so much respiration help inhalation help all right then from either endotracheal or tracheostomy tube. We're not going through tracheostomy tube. You had that in 201, I mean, excuse me, 105. Um, but just know, long-term use of any kind of breathing, we move them to a trach. We would take them off an ET tube. We saw it's going to be long-term and move them to um, a tracheostomy tube. So this is considered weaning a little bit. And finally, to oxygen. Okay, so is the patient able to hold that key number of oxygenation? Is the respiratory rate up there? Usually 92, depending on the patient, 92, 90, 92, 95. Um, respirations probably 10, 12 at minimum. Hopefully, you know, will increase. Um, successful weaning is collaborative. It's respiratory. It's the nurse. It's the doctor. Everybody monitoring this patient and making sure. Taking them off sedation because sedation can decrease that respiratory rate. Slowly weaning them down to see if they can hold their own. All right. There's certain criteria for weaning. There's some in the book, but the doctor lays it out in an order for you. Again, it's some of what I said. Can they hold their oxygen to this level? Can they hold their respiratory to this level? Is their blood pressure at this level? And it's a simple yes or no. If they can't yet, then they can't. We're not ready to move on to the next phase. We'll try again. Um, patient preparation, explaining everything to the patient, reassuring them we're doing the best we can, that we're trying, we'll get them there, you know, um, not to get discouraged. Everything, you know, a lot of it's mine, not to get discouraged. All right, methods of weaning are in the chart here stated. And teaching. Um, our patients, you know, this is more for trach, but I wanted to address just education. You want to make sure that you're explaining everything to the patient. This is more for the ICU. This is more for if a patient goes home in an airway like a trach or anything like that. But we are educating our patient with everything we do in that room. We are explaining everything we're doing, how we are doing it. I'm going to suction it. I'm going to remove it. If it has to come down to a trach, you know, that's life altering. You know, why they have to have it. So why exercise is important, why oxygenation is important, why movement is important, taking your medications is important. I put this here for that reason alone, and that table will address that. All right, this concludes this lecture.